It's, uh, it's wonderful to be at the Y again. Um, I'll read mostly from this most recent book, Rain, uh, and, and if I'm feeling brave enough, a couple of new things as well, I think. The first poem in the book is called Two Trees, and I have no idea what it's about, so... Uh, Two trees. One morning, Don Miguel got out of bed with one idea rooted in his head to graft his orange to his lemon tree. It took him the whole day to work them free, lay open their sides, and lash them tight. For 12 months, from the shame or from the fright, they put forth nothing. But one day there appeared two lights in the dark leaves. Over the years, the limbs would get themselves so tangled up, each bough looked like it gave a double crop. And not one kid in the village didn't know the magic tree in Miguel's patio. The man who bought the house had had no dream. So who can say what dark, malicious whim led him to take his axe and split the bowl along its fused seam and then dig two holes? And no, they did not die from solitude, nor did their branches bear a sterile fruit, nor did their unhealed flanks weep every spring for those four yards that lost them everything as each strained on its shackled root to face the other's empty, intricate embrace. They were trees, and trees don't weep or ache or shout. And trees are all this poem is about. Actually, it's a slight lie. I had someone come up to me recently and explain the poem to me, which was, uh, yeah. And they were right, you know. <laughs> I, I'll read a ballad, uh, it's called The Swing. <coughs> the swing was picked up for the boys, for the here and here to stay, and only she knew why it was I dug so solemnly. I spread the feet two yards apart and hammered down the pegs, filled up the holes and stamped the dirt around its skinny legs. I hung the rope up in the air and fixed the yellow seat and stood back that I might admire my handiwork complete and saw within its frail trapeze the child that would not come of what we knew had two more days before we sent it home. I know that there is nothing here, no venue and no host but the honest fulcrum of the hour that engineers our ghost. The bright sweep of its radar arc is all the human dream, handing us from dark to dark like a rope over a stream. But for all the coldness of my creed, and for all those I denied, and for all the others she had freed like arrows from her side, and for all the child was barely here, for all that we were over, I could not weigh the ghosts we are against those we deliver. I gave the empty seat a push and nothing made a sound and swung between two skies to brush her feet upon the ground. It's at this point I start leafing through this book for something more cheerful. I, and come, uh, come away empty. It's wall to wall death and divorce, to be honest with you. So, um, I'll try. This is about the best I can do. Okay. Um, and it was a poem. Actually, it was a poem that was singled out. You have, an, you have a critic called William Logan here, don't you? Um, it was singled out by Mr. Logan for a special opprobrium recently, uh, since when I felt obliged to read it on every occasion. Um, but no, but I met him recently. He's a nice guy, inevitably. Um, 
Uh, but it was in, written in response to, I have twin boys, uh, they're 10 now, and it was written in response to a question from Russell. I think it's one of those questions that all writers dread, which is, what do you really do for a living, you know? Because I know you're not a CIA operative in Dundee. Um, and uh, the way he phrased it was rather nuanced, I thought. He said, why do you stay up so late? But I, I knew what he was getting at. You know, so. And so I tried to answer, uh, to tell him about what I do in, in terms he would uh, understand. Why do you stay up so late? I'll tell you if you really want to know. Remember that day you lost two years ago at the rock pool where you sat and played the jeweler with all those stones you'd stolen from the shore? Most of them went dark and nothing more. But sometimes one would blink the secret color that had locked up somewhere in its stony sleep. And this is how you knew the ones to keep. So I collect the dull things of the day in which I see some possibility, but which are dead and which have the surprise, I don't know. And I've no pool to help me tell, so I'll look at them and look at them until one thing makes a mirror in my eyes, then I paint it with the tear to make it bright. This is why I sit up through the night. I kind of feel obliged to report that I also have an Xbox, which is the other reason. <laughs> if I'm wholly honest. Something called Red Dead Redemption at the moment. Isn't it? <coughs> the funny thing about twins is uh, that you can't, you can't you know, as I've discovered in the past, you can't write a point for one and then not the other because that makes them the bad twin. So you, you have to come up with something quite uh, swiftish. Uh, so this is a wee point for Jamie. Uh, uh, Jamie is now rapidly reaching the age where he's telling me to stop telling folk this stuff. Um, but he had, a, he had a difficult birth, as the second twin occasionally does, and he got a bit stuck. Um, uh, and he has a, the only vestige of that is a very small, it's more of a feature than a disability, a little tremor in his left hand. So this was a, a poem, again, written for, for him. Although, I, actually, now that I look at it, I see he was detained by some metaphysical quibble in the middle and just kind of went off. And <laughs> That's, uh, I think he understands half of it. Uh, it's called The Circle. My boy is painting outer space and steadies his brush tip to trace the comets, planets, moon and sun and all the circuitry they run in one great heavenly design. But when he tries to close the line he draws around his upturned cup, his hand shakes and he screws it up the shakes as old as he is, all, thank God, his body can recall of that hour when one inch from home we couldn't get the air to him. And though today is all the earth and sky for breathing space and breath, a whole damn troposphere can't cure the flutter in his signature. But Jamie, nothing's what we meant. The dream is taxed. We all resent the quarter bled off by the dark between the bowstring and the mark and trust it to Krishna or to fate to keep our arrows halfway straight. But the target also draws our aim. Our will and nature's are the same. We are its living word and not a book it wrote and then forgot. It's 14 billion year old songs inscribed in both a right and wrong. So even when you rage and mourn and bring your fist down like a stone on your spoiled work and useless kit, you just can't help but broadcast it. Look at the little avatar of your muddy water jar filling with a perfect ring singing under everything. Um, it's called correctives. The shudder in my son's left hand, he cures with one touch from his right. Two fingertips laid feather light to still his pen. He understands the whole man must be his own brother, for no man is himself alone. Though some of us have never known the one hand's kindness to the other.
it's uh, a point called the lie. As was my custom, I'd risen a full hour before the house had woken to make sure that everything was in order with the lie, his drip changed and his shackles all secure. I was by then so practiced in this chore, I'd counted maybe 13 years or more since last I'd had the nerve to meet his eye, such I like to think was our rapport. I was at full stretch to test some ligature when I must have caught a ragged thread and tore his gag away, though as he made no cry, I kept on with my checking as before. Why do you call me the lie? He said, I swore. It was a child's voice. I looked up from the floor. The dark had turned his eyes to milk and sky, and his arms and legs were all one scarlet sore. He was a boy of maybe three or four. His straps and chains were all the things he wore. Knowing I could make him no reply, I took the gag before he could say more and put it back as tight as it would tie and locked the door and locked the door and locked the door. I'll, I'll read some new things actually, which is scary. Uh, and I'm just writing sonnets at the moment. In fact, I'm going to write 48 sonnets and I'm convinced that the more people I tell, the more likely it is to happen in some kind of <laughs> self avoid You know how I got this idea? This is the second time this has happened to me. And it's like, there's a book coming out in the UK just now, and it's called Reading Shakespeare's Sonnets. It's a commentary on the sonnets. And I couldn't start the damn thing. But last year, I got one of these emails that you get from Amazon, you know, that say, you may also enjoy. <laughs> uh, you get those. Um, and, it, and it was the book and it, that hadn't, the, you know, the Shakespeare sonnet book that hadn't started yet. Uh, and it said, available for pre-order. Uh, so, so, so I thought, I'll have one of those, you know. So I, I ordered the thing. Uh, so that seemed to be uh, a bit of sympathetic magic, you know, to, to kind of get me going. But it was a funny feeling nonetheless. Um, so what, what these points are about is, 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 is quite a simple idea, really. They're all, the, 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 my obsession at the moment is this thing that's fashionably called emergence, you know. You know the idea is that you start with, uh, you know, a whole bunch of hot gas and a bit of random quantum fluctuation, you know, and, uh, and uh, no supernatural interference. Uh, then you give it 13.7 billion years uh, and you end up having this one-sided conversation in the why, you know, going to think, uh, hell did this happen, you know? Um, if that doesn't strike you as cool, yeah, <laughs> I don't know what it does. Um, this is a wee poem about, it's, it's about that kind of feedback loop of, of, of human consciousness, you know, that, that we work up from, from heaven knows where. It's called The Air. What is this dark and silent caravan that being nowhere neither comes nor goes, that being never has no hour or span of which we can see only that it flows? How was it that this empty data stream, this cache of dead light, could so lose its way it wandered back to feed on its own dream? How did that dream grow to the waking day? What is that sound that fades up from the hiss like a glass some random downdraft had set ringing, now full of its only note, its lonely call, drawing on its song to keep it singing? When will the air stop breathing? Will it all come to nothing if nothing came to this? I'll read this one actually, it's, it's written for a, uh, I'm still at that, I'm uh, kind of late 40s officially and everything, as of next week, um, uh, and one of the things that's happened recently is my friends die with greater frequency than before, uh, which, uh, and the novelty hasn't worn off yet, so I'm still writing points for them, so um, most recently it was a man called Peter Porter, a wonderful Australian poet, um, uh, who we publish in London, I work in publishing some of the time. Uh, and, uh, but we wanted to get his selected poems to Peter before he died, so we managed to get the first copy of his, uh, of his new selected poems into Peter's paw, kind of just as he was uh, uh, checking through customs, which was, was, it was nice for him to see, you know. 
and, and he was the most marvelous man with the most beautifully furnished mind. Uh, and the funny things about you know people dying is that it takes you a while to get used to the fact that you can't tell them stuff. And uh, you know, and um, uh, and I was leafing through a book called the Aberdeen Breviary, a gripping read, I should say. Um, <laughs> I, I, I came across the, <laughs> came across the Scottish saint, and, uh, and you immediately think, well, Peter would love this. And I thought, oh God, you know, I can't tell. Anyway, uh, the self illuminated, and my body and Peter Porter. As your hand turns white upon the book we'd biked across, so you might see it done. Only you could, at a time like this, put me in mind of that rum business with St. Philan of Glen Dockert, whose brief entry in the breviarium Aberdenense tells of the stone he spat when he was born, and of how denied a candle in his cell he found his left hand light up from within so he could read till sleep turned out his skin. His relics are five, his crozier or crook, his once candescent bones, his flying bell, and two long lost, one perhaps his psalter and the other a manuscript or a portable altar. Um, another feature I discovered of uh, uh, my late 40s is that uh, I, I take siestas. Actually, that makes it sound voluntary. I fall asleep in the afternoon, you know. Uh, <laughs> let's be honest about this. I read somewhere it was good for you, good for your heart. Uh, what happens to me, unfortunately, is that I'm woken up by my heart uh, 10 minutes later, beating in my ears, you know, in a state of existential crisis, you know, because uh, I'm an anxious man. Um, and it's and it's it's that feeling that I get occasionally. I don't know if you get this of being uh, of being some kind of cosmic filing error, uh, you know, because I don't remember signing up for any of this stuff, you know. And you know, waking up in the morning as a kind of bald monkey with gravity issues, thinking, you know, this, <laughs> excuse me. Um, so it, it's really about that, you know. It's called here. I must quit sleeping in the afternoon. I do it for my heart, but all too soon my heart has called it off. It does not love me. If it downed tools, it'd soon be nothing of me. Its hammer beat says, you are, not I am. It prints me off here like a telegram. What do I say? How can the lonely word know who has heard and who has sent it out? Long years since I came round in her womb, enough myself to know I was not home. My dear sea up in arms at the wrong shore, and her loud heart like a landlord at the door. Where are we now? What misdemeanor sealed my transfer? Mother, why so far afield? This is very new, actually. I'll read this one. Um, and it's a sort of a sex poem, actually, if I'm honest. <laughs> Although, and again, it's a late 40s thing. One uh, tends to find oneself featuring less and less as a dashing protagonist in this kind of poem. <laughs> um, it's more of a heraldic affair, you know? Uh, it's called two. These two, if two, can only half exist, their being so lost, so inwardly inclined, that were somehow the universal mind to make its inventory, they would be missed, their bodies having slipped between the hours and dropped down to this silent underland, the white torque of their sheet, still in her hand, like the means of their escape. From the light purse of their mouths, they pass their only coin endlessly, so none may buy or sell. Each has drawn so long and drank so deep from the other's throat or root, neither can tell tongue from tail or end from origin. Sleep will part them, but they will not sleep. I 
think I'll read this actually because David was talking a lot about music and I haven't mentioned it. Uh, and this is a wee elegy for my favourite Norwegian jazz singer. You wouldn't think <laughs> you'd have to have one, but there are many wonderful uh, uh, Scando jazz singers. Um, uh, my favourite is a woman called Radka Tonef, who died in uh, very grim circumstances. But she had a huge voice and she never used it on principle because she believed that all the important stuff was right next to the silence. Uh, so it quotes from, from Radka. It's just called Radka Tonef. I'll let you go if you let this come good. I'm speaking this as quietly as I can a mile or so into the big day wood where you lost your voice. So much for the plan to master the sounds closest to silence. Sing piano. Though I see now what you meant, when the ear lights on the half-said thing, it leans into its distance and is sent out into those spectral fires that play between the inner world and outer dark as we are to our zone of breath and blue between the world and the dark. Radka, Skylark, you rose too far. But as it died away, I heard right through the song to what sung you. I, I'll read something slightly longer. Um, <clears throat> and it's a wedding poem. It was written for a, a, a couple of friends of mine in Kerry Muir, which is a beautiful little uh, town where I used to stay in Scotland. I'm not there anymore, unfortunately. Uh, and, and it's near the, uh, the Angus Glens, and it's built out of red sandstone. Oh, I'm <laughs> trying to get you to go there. It's not irrelevant to the poem. Uh, <laughs> um, and there was a, a, a friends of mine, they were getting married, and I said, what do you want by way of a present? And they said, write us a poem, and my heart sunk. You know, I can't, I just rubbish at commissions. Um, I made something up, and they were perfectly happy, but it wasn't very good. Uh, I rewrote it a few years later, though. Um, as a sort of sci-fi poem, what had actually happened in the meantime was the DVD box set of Battlestar Galactica, I should confess. Uh, the high points of Western culture, my humble. Uh, so it's now a conversation between two aliens who've just gotten married, okay? So it's, uh, and, they're, and, and they're having a conversation about this stuff, about trust uh, and about love and about distance and, uh, and about space, you know, I always think it's... Um, sign of the patent lack of intelligent design here that everything's so inconveniently far apart. Um, so they're speaking about that kind of stuff. And, um, and you can tell when the, it's a kind of a frosty in dialogue. You can tell when the woman is speaking because she's the only one making any sense, you know, as above, so below. So, um, it's called The Day. Life is no miracle. It sparks flare up invisibly across the night. The heart kicks off again, where any rock can cup some heat and wet and hold it to its star. We are not chosen, just too far apart to know ourselves the commonplace we are. As precious only as the gold in the sea, nowhere and everywhere. So be assured that even in our own small galaxy, there is another town whose today light won't reach a night of ours till Kerry Muir is nothing but a vein of hematite. We're right now to say hairless, tall and dark, but still as like ourselves as makes no odds, push their wheeled contraptions through the park under the red leaf trees and the white birds. Last week, while skeptic of their laws and gods, they made them witness to their given word. They talk, as we do now, of the divide, but figure that who else should think of this might also find some warmth there and decide to set apart one minute of the day to dream across the parsecs, the abyss, a kind of cosmic solidarity. But it's still so sad, he says. Think all of us as cut off as a living from the dead. It's the size that's all wrong here, the emptiness. She says, well, it's a miracle I found you in all this space and dust. He turns his head and smiles the smile she recognized him through. I wasn't saying differently. 
It's just the biggest flashlight we could put together as a match struck in the wind out here. We're lost. I only meant there's no more we traverse than the space between us. The sun up there is no further. For each of us a separate universe. We talk, make love, we sleep in the same bed. But no matter what we do, you can't be me. We only dream this place up in one head. Thanks for that. You're saying that because the beds are light year wide, or might as well be, I'm even lonelier than I thought I was. No. Just that it's why we have this crap of souls and gods and ghosts and afterlives. Not to bridge eternity, just the gap. She measures it from here to here. Tough call, death or voodoo, some alternatives. Well, there's one more, that you trust me with it all. The wind is rising slowly through the trees. The dark comes and the first moon shows. They turn their later talk to what daft ceremonies the people of that star, he points to ours, might make, what songs and speeches they might learn, how they might dress for it, their hats and flowers, and what signs they exchange as stars might do, their signals meeting in the empty bands to say, even in this nothingness, I found you. I was lucky in the timing of my birth. And they stared down at their own five-fingered hands and the rings that looked like nothing on that earth. I'll read a wee poem about poetry, I think. It kind of sums it up for me. Uh, it's, it was taken, it was, it's uh, uh, worked up from a, uh, a fragment of Li Po's and it's written to the other, you know, great classical Chinese poet, Du Fu. It's actually shorter than the original. You know how windy these Orientals can be, but I got it, I got it. <laughs> I got a bit off it. Um, it's just called the poetry. I found him wandering on the hill one hot blue afternoon. He looked as skinny as a nail, as pale skinned as the moon. And below the broad shade of his hat, his face was cut with rain. Dear God, Poor Du Fu, I thought, it's the poetry again. <laughs> I'll just read, I'll t read two more poems. Uh, this is, uh, I'll read this one actually, I've never read this before. Um, it's a version of a poem by a guy I used to call uh, uh, Robert De No, thinking I was being clever, but I was pulled aside. You know, the, 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 the Scottish hobby is pedantry. <laughs> you know, it's the national sport, you know. And I was pulled aside by a friend. He said, he was from Alsace, you know. I thought, oh, forgive me. So it's, um, it's Day's Nose, okay. Anyway, it's called Sky Song. The flower told the shell, you shine. The shell told the sea, you echo. The sea told the boat, you shudder. The boat told the fire, you glow. The fire said, far less than her eyes. The boat said, far less than your heart. The sea said, far less than her name. The shell said, far less than your desire. The flower turned to me and said, she's beautiful. I said, yes, she's beautiful. She's so beautiful, I can hardly speak of it. Point called Rain. I love all films that start with rain, rain braiding a window pane, or darkening a hung out dress, or streaming down her upturned face. One big thundering downpour, right through the empty script and score, before the act, before the blame, before the lens pulls through the frame to where a woman sits alone beside a silent telephone, or the dress lies ruined on the grass, or the girl walks off the overpass. And all things 
flow out from that source along their fatal water course. However bad or over long, such a film can do no wrong. So when his native twang shows through, or when the boom dips into view, or when her speech starts to betray its adaptation from the play. I think to when we open cold in a starlit gutter, running gold with the neon of a drugstore sign, and I'd read into its blazing line. Forget the ink, the milk, the blood, all was washed clean with the flood. We rose up from the falling waters, the fallen rains, own sons and daughters. And none of this, none of this matters. Thank you.